Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are still in the Gospels. This is Gospels part 84. Last week we saw Jesus speaking almost in terms of giving the people an ultimatum through several different parables and illustrations uh, to show that this generation that he's offering in his hand the kingdom to uh, their responsibility and their knowledge of who God is and his story and saying like if it's <laughs> if, if you're not going to take advantage of this there's going to be consequences and judgment and he he started off with a description of the relationship between a servant and a master and whether that servant knew the will of the master and whenever they chose not to whether it was out of ignorance or deliberate uh, and saying that the one that acts in ignorance is going to get less of a consequence and a judgment, but he was showing that Israel is the one that knows the master's will because they know who God is. Um, He moved on from there to showing that his kingdom is one that it's going to cause division, that even among households you're going to have father and son, mother, daughter, all reacting to the message of the gospel differently and choosing differently for them for themselves and their lives which is very convicting to see that it's not all going to be received in the same way and that families are going to experience conflict because of what jesus is offering to the world Um, and then he ended with talking about this magistrate and whenever you have an accuser coming before you like why, whenever you're on your way to the judgment, would you not try to do all that you can to make amends along the way, along the road, before it's too late? And Jesus yeah. is again offering, like, guys, it's it's getting close to the end here. Uh, I need you all to repent, uh, or it's you're not going to get to experience this. Yeah, it was, I remember, you know, feeling like, generally speaking, it was a bit of a downer. <laughs> Jesus was kind of in a mood or something, right? But he's, again, he's working toward the end. We are, I don't know, maybe somewhere in the middle of that last six months. And so it's understandable. I mean, if you were him and you knew what you were headed for, well, I I might be a little slightly cranky myself. I don't know. But, you know, let's keep going because, you know, we're going to see ups and downs. Uh, We're going to be continuing in Luke today. Uh, We're beginning in chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. And this is just a little weird, but let's, let's read it and see what we got. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. <laughs> okay, we're not cheering up quite yet, but you know, this, it, I mean, aren't, isn't this weird pulling out these little stories, local stories? I mean, we'd, you'd never hear anything about this, but it somehow it shows up in the, in the Gospels. So here we are in Luke. Um, you know, Jesus, he is, he's just continuing his talk about judgment. And then at some point, some in the crowd, they, they share the story of this horrible event that has occurred, uh, apparently recently. And Pilate has 
apparently, killed some Galilean Jews. Now, this was kind of funny to me. I read it and I took it only one way, but some people read it a different way. So the question is whether they were offering sacrifices in the temple and Pilate, you know, they were killed during that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rate that one as highly likely. <laughs> and then other people actually think that it may have been part of some obscure Roman sacrifice thing, which, you know, they had a bunch of reasons why that was possible and, and all this stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there as possible, even though it doesn't really sit well with me. I think that this was Jews making sacrifices in the temple, and then they got killed by Pilate. So it's funny, it reads kind of like a statement, but it's it's also, and, and certainly Jesus treats it a, a little bit like it was a question, and, and he goes ahead and answers the question. And what he's doing is addressing a contemporary cultural belief. And we've talked about this before. There were many who believed that any kind of sickness or handicap or early death or anything like that, it was a result of the individual's own sin. And we've mentioned this before. Scriptures, scripture offers a lot of evidence that this is just not the case. And yet, the thinking was common. Now, we could say, well, look, in, in the, the, the big picture, if you're just stepping back and you can see it all, you could make a statement like, well, it is true that every bad thing is indeed the result of sin. In some way, you know, generally, that's true. But it's just not always directly connected. You know, the bad thing happens to the person who sinned. Sometimes, you know, you can can bear the brunt of somebody else's sin. It's it's, it's just a thing. So, So Jesus asks if they think that the people who were killed in the temple, do, do they think that they were worse sinners than everybody else, or or maybe just all the other Galileans. And it's that idea of, well, they went through some sort of extreme suffering or death or whatever. It must be because they were involved in some sort of extreme sin. And he asks because he wants to change their thinking. And this is really good. It's good for us even now today. See, you can't look around at yourself and at other people, circumstances, You cannot judge eternal destinies by the things you see happening in people's lives here in creation. I mean, we can look at things and I mean, we've all done it. You look at it and and it might appear like, wow, that, I mean, you know, that almost looks like some sort of judgment from God. That's a whole, you know, whatever, that's bad. Or you might look at other things and you go, well, isn't that just a blessing from God? And I mean, we could even be right sometimes, whatever, but don't don't get caught up thinking that you have some clue about a person's eternal destiny. You need to just back off that. And, you know, you don't even have to, like like I'm talking about, like the big spiritual picture. It, it, it applied then, it applies now, all that. But something we should try to remember is back in this time frame, remember, we are 40 years away from the temple being destroyed. And so, when it says, hey, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Okay, there. this also could have been a fairly direct comment toward what Jesus seems to know is going to happen to the temple in the near future. So that's a thing too, so kind of remember that. But anyway, he he raises a second example. It's it's a lot like the first. Apparently, there were 18 people who were killed when a tower fell in Siloam. And so it's kind of the same thing. Similarly, it, Jesus is asking if anybody thinks that they were worse sinners than everyone else, at least everyone else in Jerusalem. Same idea. They must have done something wrong. That's why they suffered this crazy thing. But again, he tells them it's just not so. It isn't the way things work. And, you know, the same thing. There's the big spiritual picture where we can see how this applies then and now and all this. And you never know, there may be some some hint toward the upcoming destruction of the temple. Anyway, in both cases, Jesus, you know, he's just offering some clarity, apparently clarity that he thinks they need. There's only one way to avoid 
perishing. And we might even, for our, for our sake now today, we might look at this and go, look, there's only one way to avoid perishing eternally. But either way, it's the same answer, repent. You got to return to God. You got to be faithful, loyal, obedient, and not the way you see it. You got to be faithful, loyal, and obedient the way it's defined in Torah. And there, this is where uh, everyone's security lies. Regardless of what things look like all around them, you might walk around for, I don't know, all the years of your life, and everyone around you could look at your life and be thinking, my goodness, God really doesn't like that guy. He's just walking around in judgment all the time. And you might actually be just 100% completely, totally secure because you are faithful, loyal, obedient to God, you know, all that kind of thing. You just can't tell by the look of things. Yeah, this story is interesting. I'm trying to put all the pieces together contextually. Should we treat these first five verses in the 13th chapter of Luke kind of like a a moving on from the previous account that we talked about last week where Jesus was digging into them about repenting and judgment that's company, uh, coming here at the end of his ministry and here in the first verse where it says that like there were some present who came and told him about these accounts that you we shouldn't treat them as related, maybe? I, I'm just trying to s- see how they fit together. Yeah, I, personally, I think that chapter 13, verse 1, is just continuing right where chapter 12, verse 59 left off. I think it's the same thing. The The continuing story. He He was talking a lot about judgment then, and he's just continuing it right here. Hmm. That's the way I read it. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, I know that there's gaps in, you know, the the eyewitness accounts of Jesus in the Gospels. There's no way that they could have oh, yeah. uh, written verbatim every single conversation that happened. But I just wonder if, like, some of these people who were hearing Jesus clap back at them about the need for repentance and the coming judgment saying, like, well, Jesus, why why are you suggesting that that's going to be our fate? Because, like, look at our lives. Like, we're following Torah. We're trying to be obedient, and we're not like these people who are you <laughs> know, sick and mangled and uh, all right. experiencing all of this hardship that we, we are usually accustomed to their sinfulness, and Jesus is now addressing that to be like, guys, you're not getting it. Like, you can't be playing the comparison game here. Yeah. No, I think what you're saying is awesome. It's, it's really, really good. You, what you made me think of is, you know what, it's, it, and it's, I, I'm going to now move away from the point of the text and sort of back up and talk about just the text itself and say, well, now remember, Luke is writing this. He's writing it years. I mean, we might even be reasonable in measuring it in decades after Jesus was going through all this stuff. So Luke may be presenting it as a continual story because all of these little accounts fit together in his mind, and maybe they didn't really happen all together in one day or one short time time span or whatever. Or it could be that Luke, you know, he got some good info about, oh, there's this one time, Jesus, blah, 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 blah. And they tell the, and maybe it all, it all happened all at once. So, so those are things we don't know either. I mean, we got to leave room for, look, they could be faithfully uh, representing things as they happened, or they could be gathering, collecting a bunch of things together and and you know faithfully representing all those individual things but collecting them and gather, gathering them and presenting them as a whole and maybe they really weren't in the first place so i don't know there's a lot of stuff like that samuel it's hard to know yeah i would say at the very least i think it's fair to say well at least the way luke is presenting it this is a this is a, a continuation okay where we left off. So yeah. I, I don't know. It's good. It's good question. Good point. So I don't know if only oh, time travel. <laughs> I, people talk about stuff like that all the time. And there, uh, there's not even a question. There is only one place and one time that I would go. Mm. 
<laughs> I want to see this stuff right here. Yeah. So send me back and pick me up three and a half years later or something. In- instead of hot tub time machine, it's mosquito on the wall fly uh, yeah. time machine. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, well, let's go on and see what else he's got in store for us. We're still in uh, Luke 13. We're going to look at verses 6 through 9. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Well, that's, I mean, that's an interesting parable. I mean, in terms of like the the agriculture part of it, I mean, we can easily picture it in our heads and it all kind of makes sense. But surely Jesus wasn't giving us lessons about how to grow trees or something. I mean, so what what is he talking about? It's an interesting parable. So we're going to see more about fig trees in upcoming stories, but but here... Luke is fitting it into this continuing theme on judgment. And so, uh, just a side note, this this whole imagery of figs and vines. Samuel, do you know what that represents? Do you remember we've talked about this? Uh, I mean, I know that there's talk about in the kingdom, in the next age, that everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree. Yes, exactly. That's perfect. The whole imagery of figs and vines, it's all closely connected to the kingdom. And so, fig trees, in this example, a fig tree not producing means that that kingdom image is in jeopardy. So the basic idea is that a vineyard owner will not tolerate, at least not continually, will not tolerate a tree or plant that isn't producing. He'll remove it. He'll put another one in its place. Why? The owner wants fruit. Is there anything unreasonable about that, Samuel? Nope. It's, it's, it's easy for us to see and relate to. And then you have this vine dresser, this, the guy that's working in the, in the vineyard. He wants to give it one more chance. Just a little extra TLC. See if he can get it to do what it was created for, what it is expected to do. And if it doesn't respond, well, you know, fine. We'll cut it down. We'll replace it. So now let's talk about who's who or what is who or whatever, because we do this with parables. You've got to kind of figure out what each piece part represents. The vineyard. Got a guess, Samuel? Uh... Would that be Israel itself? Yes. The vineyard, and this goes, uh, you know what? I didn't look it up. I should have had a reference. I don't have one. The vineyard is Israel. Comes right out of the text. So now within the vineyard, the vines and the trees might represent individual Israelites or or, or maybe generations of Israelites, something like that. I can't be sure. But this barren fig tree. Now this one, it starts to get a little easier to understand. The barren fig tree that Jesus is talking about in these people, in this context, is this generation in Israel. So the fruit, and that it doesn't matter if we're talking about the grapes from the vine or the figs from the tree, whatever, the fruit is righteousness, justice, mercy, charity, etc. So, well, and and we might even add, because we do this all the time, all of those things, those are the, the end goal of Torah. It's not just a bunch of rules. So, God is the one who owns the vineyard, and Jesus is the vine dresser. And so all of this digging and fertilizing that he's talking about, what do you think that is, Samuel? Um, 
like Jesus doing his ministry to try to get repentance and change in their lives? Yeah, exactly. How is he going to try to get this fig tree, this generation in Israel, to produce fruit? Well, he's got to teach. He's got to call them to repentance. And and in some sense, maybe even give them, maybe we could call it the motivation, knowing that the kingdom is at hand kind of thing. So yeah, that's that's what he's doing. He, so he's acting as the vine dresser. So Jesus's point in telling this parable, and, and you know, along with any of the other parables, it's this: people have been looking at each other, trying to determine if they are sinful or righteous based on their external circumstances. That's that's what we talked about in the par- parable right before. You can't look around and judge. Well, okay, so that's what they're doing, and this is folly. It, it, it's, uh, it's never going to work. Instead, they need to be paying more attention to themselves. If they repent and begin producing good fruit, again, justice, charity, etc., they can expectantly hope in God for life in the kingdom. It's not hope like, oh, I just wish it could maybe happen. No, it's I have a hope in God. I expect this to come to pass because I know him. And the time, the time is now. This will always and continually be true. It was true for the generation that Jesus was talking to, and it's true for us right now. You know, you can't just say you're a Christian. You can't say, oh, I went up to the altar when I was a kid. You can't just say, I go to church on Sundays. You can't just say, well, I don't drink or smoke or cuss. And, and you know, I, I what, those are great things. But you can do that and not really be in tune with God. There's so much in the Torah, so much that we're called to. We need to be his hands and feet on the earth. And so the same way it was for them, then it is for us now. And I guess maybe just one extra little thing, this this whole idea of observing others, there is an aspect of keeping one another accountable. Maybe we could even say judging one another uh, regarding sin as as brothers. And that's a good thing. But that's not what is in view here. This was observing others trying to actually gauge or judge or determine their final destiny. That's good stuff, Paul. I, actually, I have a reference for you if people are wondering about the Israel and oh. Vineyard. Yes! Uh, so generally... If you just go to Isaiah chapter 5, that whole chapter is just chock full of imagery about God's relationship with Israel and using vineyard over and and over again. But specifically, verse 7, like listen to how explicit this is. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, (laughs) and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. Samuel, are you sure that's what that means? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's pretty explicit. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you for looking that up. I knew it was there. I just didn't think to look. What I'm here for. Yeah, that's right. That's just one of the many, many wondrous things you're here for. <laughs> one of the other w- wonderful things is that you're going to listen to Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, along with everyone else. All right. All right, here we go. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And she glorified 
God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, All his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. All right, I think we're leaving the kind of testy Jesus. (laughs) Uh, And and we're getting, well, I mean, he's still testy with this guy, obviously. (laughs) But... You know, it's, it's, at least it's a little more fun story, right? So here it is, Jesus. And guess what, Samuel? Jesus is honoring the Sabbath. Who would have thunk? And not just this, what's that? I said, who would have thunk? Yeah, not just this time. He, it, it's again and 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 again. It's, it, he loves it. He's honoring the Sabbath. He's teaching in a synagogue. Now, We already know that he was loved and honored by many. We've seen that in a number of times throughout. Now, at that synagogue, there happened to be a woman. She was afflicted by a spirit, and it disabled her. And let's just say this out loud. Just as not every bad thing is a direct result of sin, it is a result of sin generally, but not directly to the person who's suffering, Same way, not every infirmity was caused by a demon. But, apparently, this one was. I'm just saying, because there are those who see a demon in every single thing everywhere, and it's like, okay, sometimes not, okay? Sometimes not. But anyway, Jesus calls her over. She didn't even ask. She was just sitting there enjoying synagogue on Saturday, right? She just, he calls her over. And so here she is taking this, I'm guessing it's probably kind of an awkward trip from wherever she is over to where he is, all in front of everybody, bent over, right? He declares her healed. And only then does he lay his hands on her and she then is healed kind of cool, right? I mean, that's confidence right there. Mm. You are healed. And then he does it. That's pretty good. But this is also cool. She immediately glorifies who, Samuel? Let's see. Back in verse 13, it says at the end, and she glorified God. Yeah. She didn't glorify Jesus. And and I'm not saying that is, is like a bad thing. This woman understood the Father, God, He was the source of it all. It's kind of a neat picture. So, anyway, she gets it. Now, the Jews, this is so cool, the Jews have included in their morning prayers for centuries, and I'm guessing they were doing it even at this time. This particular phrase, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who straightens the bent. Wow. So you never know. I mean, maybe when it says she glorified God, she might have been shouting that very sentence right there. We don't know, but whatever. It's kind of a neat picture. And I just want to point this out because we've talked about this a number of times throughout our reading through the Gospels. No one is mentioned as having faith or belief, or anything like it in this story, Jesus just does it. Now, I'm not saying that that necessarily means anything or doesn't mean anything. I'm just saying 
It's another thing to notice along with all the other stories we've seen with Jesus healing, etc. Now, Samuel, doesn't that all seem great? Isn't this a great story? Yeah. Healing that lady? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not great to everyone. You got this leader of the synagogue, which, by the way, he's likely the guy that invited Jesus up to teach. Think about that. It's interesting. Come, yeah. Come on up here and teach. And then he does this. Well, he didn't like that at all. <laughs> so, and I know we've talked about this before. We had uh, at least a couple of different camps, one that thought that healing to prevent death on the Sabbath, you know, okay, maybe that's okay, but no other kind of healing. And then you had a much smaller a minority that thought, no, I think you can heal, period. It's, it's a good thing. You can do that on Sabbath. Well, it, it would appear that this leader of the synagogue was in that camp that believed that, you know, maybe if you're going to prevent death, that might be okay, but otherwise, no way, don't do it. Now, again, she'd been afflicted for 18 years, so from this guy's perspective, perspective, he's probably thinking, eh, what's one more day? Which, on one hand, sounds kind of, I don't know, in a weird way, true and reasonable, and at the same time, it sounds really low class, doesn't mm, it? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Jesus has shown more than once that he disagrees with this line of thinking. He prioritizes the alleviation of suffering over the Sabbath. He's not alone in this line of thinking, but it was a minority at this time, as far as we know. And then you got to know, Jesus, he's got the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So he's got some special abilities that kind of I don't know, it elevates this controversy or it exacerbates the controversy or whatever, because, I mean, he can do some pretty amazing things and, you know, quote unquote, easily, whatever. So it really, it messes things up a lot. But anyway, the synagogue leader, he decides not to talk to Jesus. He ignores Jesus, speaks directly to the people, which, I don't know. I guess it could be taken more than one way, but I think that that's kind of a, that's kind of a, you know, in your face back to Jesus. He just ignores him and talks to the people and it made it appear a bit like a rebuke or correction. Now he spoke it as if he was rebuking or correcting the people, but I don't know. I think the dude was on some shaky ground there. Uh, th there were probably uh, some in attendance who were equally offended, like the synagogue leader was, and, you know, they're probably murmuring their disapproval or whatever, but then you had others who maybe agreed with Jesus, whatever. Well, here's the thing. The synagogue leader may not have liked it, but guess what? Jesus didn't like what the synagogue leader did, and so he calls them all out. The synagogue leader and anybody who agrees with him calls them all hypocrites, and again, these are actors, pretenders. And here's why, because they would all untie and lead one of their animals to water on a Sabbath, alleviating an animal's suffering, but they were unwilling that they or anyone else should loose the bonds, or we could say untie a human. Now, notice Jesus never actually argued that this was not a violation of Sabbath. He's simply arguing for a better understanding of what Sabbath was really about. Just that this idea that alleviating human suffering was more important. We've seen the argument played out before. Jesus' opponent, Jesus' opponents were, in fact, acting shamefully. And it's awesome. Because in the text, we see that they, they were actually put to shame. They felt the shame of what they were doing. Now, okay, Samuel, this probably isn't our best emotion, but when you see stuff like that happen in the Gospels, kind of kind of feels good, right? <laughs> A bit. Justice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Again, probably not good for us to feel that way, but you know, it, there, there is in it some sense of justice and things made right and whatever. And you know what? That's very, very godlike. So it's, it's not like it's all bad, but we just <laughs> probably should be a little careful with it. Mm. Anyway, the majority, it seems, 
recognize that these works are from God, they are glorious, and they rejoiced. And so the the stuffy, stodgy, religious-y types, they sort of get theirs, and the people love that Jesus is, you know, doing the good stuff. God's doing it through him. So. Mm. Yeah, this is a good section. I enjoyed it and have things to respond uh, Do about. It. So first thing is going to be a statement, and second thing is going to be kind of a question, uh, getting into the text a little bit. So my comment is, it's it's so eye-opening to me to see how Jesus is interacting yet again with the Sabbath here in this story, um, and then thinking about that in terms of it being one of God's commandments. And, I mean, we could go back to the Torah, like when God rescued Israel from Egypt and he met them and married them on Sinai and gave them the law, like, keeping the Sabbath was one of the things he commanded them. It was a gift. Um, and oftentimes, like we, from our Western perspective, we treat God's commands as, like, without a doubt, hard black and white, like, thou shalt not lie. Like, we, we hear that commandment, and we think, like, you know, it. there's no other way to interpret that. Like, telling the truth always is in God's favor, and if I lie in any sort of circumstance, that's a sin. But here's an example of just the way that Jewish thinking, to what lengths they go to prioritize compassion, mercy, uh, minimizing people's shame and disgrace in their lives. Um, there was this thought in, in Jewish, like, halakala, like trying to interpret the law in their daily lives that... Um, if there was a circumstance socially when you're interacting with someone and for whatever reason in the conversation something gets brought up uh, truthfully that causes that person public disgrace or shame yeah. that the rabbis said, in that case, it would be more preferable for you to lie about that person's character in order to honor like their integrity uh, and you know, bring Protect up stuff their privately. Reputation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, I, I think that's just a great example that kind of fits in the same vein as right here in uh, this instance about the Sabbath. Like, I'm not trying to say that we should treat God's commandments as this, you know, rubber, and we can bend them however we want to. I, I'm I'm bringing it up more to show the dynamic nature of who God is and how He's meeting humanity where we are at and what we're battling with and dealing with with one another with yeah. the commandments that he's given us. Yeah, priority plays such a role and and that is very foreign to modern American Christian types and maybe everywhere in the world, I don't know, but yeah, you're exactly right. Here's a I, I know you have more, but this is I, one of my favorite examples. So, World War 2, Nazism there were people who were saving Jews, and how were they doing that? They were doing that by lying, hiding, deceiving, all of those things, but they were saving lives. That was good. And if you live in a world that's all black and white, you would go, well, those people are going to hell because they saved those people by lying. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that sounds weird, doesn't it, when you say mm -hmm. it that way? So, yeah, they, they're, it's a great example. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm glad you responded to my response. That's good. Um, my question about the text is, uh, I, and I wonder if other listeners picked up on this in, uh, let's see. Oh, okay, so after the ruler of the synagogue responded in verse 14, I find it so interesting in verse 15 on how Luke, the writer, addresses Jesus. It's in, instead of like, in the same story previously, like verse 12, Luke, the writer, uses, like, when Jesus saw her, he called her over. But in this verse, it's so interesting. It says, then the Lord answered him. Yeah. And I wonder, this is Samuel Midrash, you know, alert going on. I wonder if this is, if Luke is getting at the Lord of the Sabbath vibes that he's talked about and other gospel writers have talked about since this oh. is a 
story about um, the Sabbath. And Luke himself in this very gospel says it. Uh, it's like in Luke chapter 6, verse 5, he has Jesus himself saying, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So I, I just yeah. wonder if there's a connection there. That's really good. Yeah, I mean, obviously I can't answer your question, but I think that's a great that's a great way to look at it, a great way to contemplate the text and look for those connections. That's super cool, Samuel. Yeah, it's like maybe Luke brought it up to say, like, who would know the Sabbath better than the Lord yeah. of it, the master of it? And that's exactly. why he addresses him as the Lord there. Oh, that's good. That is good. I like it. It's funny because you 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 wondered if anybody caught that. And I remember when I was reading it, I had that little thought in the back of my mind. Oh, look, he called him the Lord. But you actually brought it out, you know, mm. so it's good. It's good. Like it, like it. All right. Anything else? Let's keep moving. Well, this next one is long. It may be the last thing we do, but, you know, be patient while I read it. Here we go. We're looking at Luke chapter 13. We're just continuing. This is now verses 22 through 30. It says this. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of a house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me. All you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Wow. Kind of cool and kind of crazy, huh? Mm -hmm. So I mean, let's just work our way through this a little bit at a time. Luke reminds us, first of all, that Jesus is heading for Jerusalem. Now, I, I think it's fair to say that this is maybe a little more thematic, like Luke ever since... Well, maybe since the the transfiguration or whatever, it's been like a, a bit of a theme. But Luke is using it just to say, look, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And it doesn't mean that he's making one single grand trip. It just means that's where this is all headed. And Luke, you know, he's likely uh, he, he's he, likely covering more than one trip, as we'll see later when we're going to move into John here pretty soon. But anyway, in our chronological timeline, we're somewhere in between the last of the fall festivals, Sukkot and the eighth day, and then the upcoming spring festival of Passover, which is where we're going to see his death and resurrection. So we could be somewhere near the time of Hanukkah. So just, just getting you sort of situated there. Now, someone asks what I think is just a super important question. Will those who are saved be few. Now, this touches on another ongoing debate here in Jesus's time. You had you had some some uh, a group that would say, uh, "No, all Israel has a share in the world to come." So it's a very broad kind of definition of who would be participating. But then you had others who they hung on to phrases something like, "No." He who practices them shall live by them. And by live, they meant eternally in the kingdom type thing. 
So only the faithful among Israel would go. And so instead of broad, it was very narrow. And so knowing that this debate existed in Jesus's time, well, now you can see Jesus is definitely taking a side. And so he begins with some advice. You should seek to enter through the narrow door. And then he, I think, more directly answers the question, many will seek to enter, but will not be able. So Samuel, in the, in the most basic sense, when somebody says, will few be saved? What do you think Jesus' answer is? Uh, yep. Yeah. Relatively speaking, yes, because many will seek and won't be able. So then you got to wonder, though, what's this narrow door? You want to care to take a guess, Samuel? Uh, well, didn't we talk previously weeks ago and John about, or have we not got there about Jesus saying he's the good shepherd and he's also the door? Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. We did the, the, the gatekeeper, I think. Mm-hmm. What we were talking about, yeah, or something, yeah. Yeah, good point. He doesn't explicitly explain it anywhere in here. So we have to go from, you know, the context here and everything else that we've been learning up to this point. And I, even even though he's not explicit, I think it's actually quite easy. The narrow door is quite simply what you've heard us say on this podcast about six billion times, repentance, loyalty, faithfulness, that's the narrow door. That's it. And so Jesus uses now an example. So he's going to try to help them understand. He uses the example of a master of a house. And now, you know, when you're invited somewhere, you you can't just show up whenever you want, right? You're you're invited at a certain time, a certain place, whatever. That's when you go. And, And you can't just show up if you're not actually on the guest list. That also would be a bad thing, right? Now, this is, you know, I'm I'm sort of leaving way for Southern hospitality that says, you know, you just show up unannounced and when you're on your way out the door, they say, come back when you can stay longer, you know. It, so it's, but you get the idea. It, it, isn't, it isn't appropriate in most circumstances. Now, at some point, the master of the house, he's going to close the doors. Now, this is, this is very first century Israel culture. The master closes the door and no one else is allowed in. And part of the reason for this is because the guests that were on time, the ones that showed like they were supposed to, well, now they could remain and enjoy, I don't know, call it the festivities uninterrupted. It was was yet another way of just being socially polite. And so it was a a practical example they could all relate to, but... The many in this particular story are going to try to get in anyway. So little little modern English would be like, come on, Jesus, it's us. Let us in. Sorry we are late. But he will respond with, I don't know where you come from, which is very much like saying, I don't know you, or I wasn't expecting you, or I don't know. Even more colloquial, where the heck did you come from, right? <laughs> but because they are not allowed in, it's it's kind of a picture, kind of an image of being put on the ban. That's a, a phrase from back in that day. And it, it, it represented a severed relationship. You don't get to come in here. I don't even know who you are. I Whatever. So Jesus, he then leaves that example And he starts talking a little more directly about actual entrance into the kingdom, which is what he was already alluding to. And he says that the many are going to respond with something like, and again, I'll I'll do some modern language. Come on, dude, seriously, it's us. We've shared meals together. We followed you everywhere. But they still won't be let in. They're going to get that. Where the heck did you come from? And then he explains the difference between those who are allowed in and those who are not. And he doesn't do it in a direct way. It's an indirect way because he says, depart from me, you workers of evil. 
Now, a lot of people read that and they think, oh, they must be talking about, you know, your Jeffrey Dahmers and, you know, Adolf Hitler's of the world, that kind of stuff. No, no, he's talking about those who do not do his will. Even if that is, you know, in ignorance, like you don't actually even know what his will is because you don't read it or whatever. Uh, The ones who will enter, the ones who will be allowed in are those who repent and return to God and his Torah. And I include that because that's God's definition of good. So you are workers of good, not workers of evil. And just to say it out loud. It, when you're listening, there, in nowhere in this is there any kind of a demand for perfection. I mean, that'd be great and all, but the, if there's a demand for anything, the demand is for loyalty, for faithfulness, for a heart and mind and everything else that that is truly toward God, for God. And God is the one who sees and he knows and he can see all that. All right, so it's good. So Jesus, and well, I guess he he ends up, he paints this really graphic image. If you don't repent, you're going to be observing the kingdom from Gehenna. You'll see all of the stars of the faith there, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets, all of that. You'll see the righteous from all over the earth, all enjoying the banquet together. And I mean, that's a pretty sad picture when you try to imagine it. The thing that we aren't sure of here, he may be alluding all the way out to even the inclusion of the Gentiles, which is going to come like after his death. That's a possibility. Or he may, in this this context, he may be, you know, remaining a little more local. He may just be speaking of Israel because Israel has been scattered all throughout the earth and he's going to gather them together. So I don't know which it is. It doesn't really matter. The overall point is the same, and we know that ultimately both get included. So there's that. Uh, And then he just adds one final bit. There's this reminder that this world is upside down when compared to the kingdom, and that, you know what? There are some that you may think are definitely in, and maybe they're not. There are some that you may think are going to be honored guests And you know what? They won't be. And of course, vice versa, right? We see the ones, they they look good. They look like they would be first, but they're going to be last. And those that look bad, they look like they're going to be last, but they'll be first. So I I don't know. This was a good one, Samuel. I like this part. Yeah, this is heavy stuff uh, for sure. It's in its painting. So much imagery in my head. Um, I think that we've mentioned it in weeks prior. I'm just going to bring it up briefly again if you've forgotten, because I know that we've talked about a whole lot of stuff in this podcast uh, since we started. But whenever Jesus is referencing in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Definitely, there there is a spiritual component to that, uh, you know, about that place in the grave for those that are not experiencing paradise before their time comes, you know, resurrection, ultimate judgment, all of that. But there also was a tangible, literal place in the land of Israel that was connected to that. Uh, It was called the Valley of ben Hemon. There's a couple different references in the Bible. I think Joshua 15, 8 is one. Jeremiah 7, 31 is another. And it was this area on the outskirts of Jerusalem where it, and I'm getting a lot of this from Marty Solomon, so I'm, uh, there might be some gaps missing in here if you do studying on your own. But it, it was essentially treated like it, Jerusalem's like trash dump. Uh, like they would send all their trash out to the outskirts of the city and set it on fire to dispose of it. Uh, and unfortunately, it was also the place where, like, the most impoverished people in Jerusalem would be living. And so, yeah. I I also get this picture, and and in our show notes, um, this is just one article that I found of someone else's like Messianic Jewish interpretation of this passage in Luke that we just finished. Like, 
he argues that it could be like if Jesus is talking about the 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 literal kingdom right here because he talks about you know you're going to see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob all be in the holy city with Jesus as king like that sounds very like kingdom has been literally established on earth in Jerusalem and reigning for a thousand years. It's very possible that Jesus could be saying like those of you who did not know me and did not follow me truly like you're not going to get to experience the messianic kingdom in Jerusalem where it's all happening like you're going to be physically cast out to that same place where the the people you know most afflicted by uh, injustice and the people of God not taking care of them like it was said that the impoverished people because the stench was so bad in that valley of Ben Homon that they would be weeping and they would be gnashing their teeth because the state of being there was so bad and Jesus could be arguing like like first you're going to you're going to experience the kingdom from afar on the outskirts and then you're going to die and you're going to spend the rest of your time spiritually in Gehenna until the end when you're resurrected and you face judgment. So I just wanted to bring that up that, again, there's this dyadic thing going on where there's a spiritual element that Jesus is referencing, but he's also connecting it to the land and to the culture that they were familiar with and aware of. So I just really like details like that. That, that stuff just gets me going. Yeah, that's super good. And, I mean, think about it. When the kingdom comes, there will be some who are resurrected, but many, 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 many will have died. Well, where are they going to be witnessing it from? Gehenna in the grave. Mm -hmm. But the kingdom isn't like everybody on earth goes away unless you're part of Jesus's crew or whatever. I mean, it's a different time, right? There are some outside the city. Well, where are they going to be watching it from? From the, the outside. Valley. Yeah, from yeah. the valley. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's like both and, not either or. So yeah, it's a neat picture. Good one, Samuel. Well, hey, I'm thinking if we want to not cause people weeping and gnashing of teeth, <laughs> we should stop right here. Do you think that's ever happened with any of our listeners? I hope not. <laughs> no way. How could you not love us? <laughs> uh, weeping tears of joy and uh, gnashing popcorn because of how entertaining it is. See, now you've got the image. <laughs> and I'm still right. We should stop. Okie dokie. Oh! Thanks for listening to the Okie dokie Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at our website, www.okidokimos.com. Feel free to send us any questions or comments to our email address, okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.